Welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. My name's Lou, but you can call me whatever you like. I'm married to Ruby, and we've been together for four years. We haven't decided to have kids yet because we enjoy our freedom a lot. Maybe we'll change our minds later, but not until we're older. Both of us grew up poor and didn't meet until we were 18 at a college event. Ruby did really well in college and now works as an accountant. I didn't do as well in school, but I'm good at working hard and doing business. When I was 15, I started cleaning in local stores and offices. By the time I was 18, I was managing 30 workers and had contracts with big companies in town. Ruby was job hunting and I needed more staff. When she approached my table at the event, she handed me her resume and said, I'm not looking for a cleaning job, but maybe you'd like my phone number. I called her before she even reached the next table and asked her out to dinner the next evening. We tied the knot. Thanks to the event, Ruby landed a job in the purchasing department of an engineering firm, starting from the bottom rung. After eight years, she ascended to head both the purchasing and credit control departments. Consequently, we enjoyed a comfortable lifestyle on dual incomes without children. Meanwhile, my business flourished, becoming the city's largest office and store cleaning company after acquiring two competitors. Typically, cleaners and security guards are the first to notice unusual occurrences in offices, sparking conversation among staff. About four months ago, while I was working at my desk, my secretary told me there was a man waiting to see me in the reception area. She gave me his business card, which said, Ross Evans, private detective. I told her to bring him in. When he arrived, I greeted Mr. Evans and shook his hand. I asked him why he was there. After we said hello, he sat down with a smile. Before we start, could I have some coffee, he asked. I haven't had any all day, and I really need a cup. I understood completely. It seems like coffee is essential for many people who run businesses. My assistant quickly got us some coffee without needing to be asked again. She brought two mugs with milk and sugar already in them, but neither of us took any. After a bit of small talk, I guided the conversation to the main topic. So, Ross, how can I help you? He didn't waste any time getting to the point. Please, just call me Ross, he said. I work as a private investigator. My client suspects his wife might be having an affair or getting close to one. She works as an accountant at Stevens Piping, a company that gets supplies from a M. Metals. They recently hired a new salesman, Alistair Clark. He has a reputation for going after married women. He's been pursuing my client's wife, sending her flowers, late night texts, and such. It's all pretty typical until now, but he started suggesting they meet up overnight. We've gathered a lot of information, but we need to fill in some gaps. I found myself interested in what he had to say. The whole spy scenario is pretty amusing, but the name in metals rings a bell. Ruby's company also sources materials from them, and this Clark character sounds like someone I'd rather keep Ruby away from. I glanced up and caught Ross looking at me, evidently awaiting a response. So I queried, I get the gist, but how can I assist? He grinned. I was hoping you'd ask. It's simple. Clark leaves flowers, notes, and other items on her desk. She reads them and tosses them in the trash. Your staff handles the trash. They can collect anything personal from him and pass it on to us. We'll vet it through our legal team. Gathering personal items poses no legal issue. We've also cleared it with her employer. Here's the authorization to gather information. By cooperating, they sidestep potential legal troubles stemming from violating her contracts if you're wondering why they agreed. Here's the CEO's card. Give him a call to confirm. The CEO's number was already in my phone. Without a word to Ross, I dialed. He picked up on the second ring and without preamble stated, Lou, I understand Ross Evans is with you. I authorize you to receive and transmit any non-company related information to him or his team. Our lawyer is drafting a formal letter, which we'll email you. I've got to go. He's waiting in my office. But ring me if you need anything else. With that, he hung up before I could speak. Clearly, they wanted this sorted pronto. Ross smiled at me. I simply nodded and remarked. He confirmed what you said. Give me all the details and we'll start collecting our trash in a separate bag. I'll sort through it here and you can pick it up every morning at 11. Does that work for you? Ross said, it's perfect. Then I called the leader of the crew we had assigned and Ross told us what to look for. We searched for things like early lunches, late lunches, flowers, notes, and more. We worked with Ross for about six weeks. At the end of that time, he said the investigation was done. One of my workers noticed that the person we were watching didn't come back after lunch. 
We told Ross about it. He followed them to a motel. After that, the marriage ended in divorce. Things at work and home went back to normal until one day Ruby seemed a little worried. I attempted to inquire, but she remained tight-lipped. About a week later, Donna, a seasoned employee who had been with me almost since the beginning, entered my office. Donna was a valued employee whom I considered a friend. Being 25 years my senior, she treated me like a son. As she settled into a chair, I sensed something was amiss. Then she began, remember a few months back when we were involved in that surveillance at the office? My interest peaked. I responded. How could I forget? It was quite an intriguing time. Why do you bring it up? I looked at her with interest. Go on, I said. She paused before continuing. As you know, I work in the same office as your wife now, and the man we were watching is visiting her office. I saw a big bunch of flowers, and she took them with her to lunch. Here's the card that came with the flowers. She gave me the card, and I read it. It said, Dear Ruby, thank you for helping me renew my contract with your company. I'm so grateful to you. I hope we can have lunch together and catch up. With love, Alistair. My blood ran cold. The language on the card strongly implied that this wasn't their first personal interaction, and the relationship was dangerously close to crossing marital boundaries. I recalled from Ross that this individual was persistent and successful in pursuing married women, and my wife was now a target. Thanking Donna, I requested she keep a close watch and provide me with daily updates. If any further notes surfaced, I asked her to bring them to me immediately upon discovery. Without hesitation, I picked up the phone and dialed Ross's number. He picked up on the third ring. Hello, Lou. How can I assist you? I wasted no time relaying Donna's report. A staffer just briefed me. She used to handle nightly cleanup during your investigation. Once it wrapped up, we reassigned her. Now she's in my wife's office. Donna informed me that the same Mr. Clark is now making moves on my wife, even taking her out to lunch. I've got a card with flowers from him indicating his intentions. Ross took a deep breath. Our inquiry into Mr. Clark is ongoing. You're actually the third husband involved presently. The difference is that the other two didn't know who he was at first. They've agreed to share the costs. Would you like to join them? I quickly said. Absolutely. What's next? Ross suggested meeting with the other husbands at 2 p.m. He also suggested, Could you come to my office to meet, fill out paperwork, and share information? I agreed to arrive at 1.55 p.m. In Ross's office, I found Dan McWilliams and Johnny Ashley, along with Ross and his colleague, Mike Pearson, who was collecting information on the case. Ross started the meeting by saying, Gentlemen, we're here because you three are in the same situation. Dan, Johnny, meet Lou. He wants to join your investigation. If you agree, we'll sign him up as a client and share information. They looked at me, then at Ross, and said, Yes, that's fine. Filling out the paperwork took about 15 minutes. After that, I used my personal credit card to pay the $5,000. Since Ruby wouldn't see this transaction on our statement, Ross addressed Dan, Johnny, and me. Our shared issue revolves around Mr. Alistair Clark. Lou, just to fill you in, Dan's wife works alongside Mr. Clark at a metals, while Johnny's wife is employed by the school board, which sources medals for tech classes in schools. Mr. Clark follows a well-rehearsed routine. He pursues women at their workplace with flowers, messages, lunches, and often attempts to lure them to a motel after lunch. He employs the same tactics with married women, pressuring those with children into infidelity and coercing childless women to request free passes from their husbands. He seems to derive pleasure from husbands knowing he's captured their wives' affection. He arranges weekend getaways only to abandon them later. Over the past year, we've documented at least five divorces in our area attributable to him. Further investigation revealed his previous employment in Dallas, where he was terminated after being sued by seven husbands in a class action lawsuit spanning three years for alienation of affection. This man is despicable. Ross paused to take another sip of coffee. Lou, are you assigned to clean at a metals or the school district office? As per our last check, if you collect trash from your wife's bin, you're free to use its contents unless there's a confidentiality agreement in your contract with the company you're cleaning for. I shook my head. No, we aren't. Neither was my response. Ross acknowledged. That's unfortunate. Nonetheless, continue gathering garbage from your wife's bin. Who covers your wife's phone bill? I replied. My business does. Ross grinned and inquired. What's her phone number? Samsung. I stated matter-of-factly. Great. 
please complete this form granting us permission to retrieve data from her phone. He then handed me a paper with a QR code and added, scan this code on her phone, it'll direct you to our server. Use the username and password given, and a program will be put on her device. This program will send all calls, messages, emails, and WhatsApp chats to us. We know he usually uses a mobile phone to avoid his spouse answering calls at home. The meeting ended with Dan, Johnny, and me sharing phone numbers and making a WhatsApp group. Ross and Mike joined too, to share information easily. When I got home, Ruby was already there, looking worried. She held onto her phone tightly and seemed distant when we talked. She went to feed the dog, taking her phone, which was unusual. When I asked about her day, she said she felt tired after a strange day and went to bed at 9.32, much earlier than usual. I stayed up until our usual bedtime, then looked for her phone. It wasn't where it usually is, so I went to our bedroom. I saw a telephone cord near the bed, and when I looked closer, I found her phone under her pillow. It bothered me, so I went to bed feeling worried. Luckily, she got up in the middle of the night, which gave me a chance to quickly scan the QR code put in the details, and return her phone without her noticing. The next morning, before she left for work, she wandered around the house without saying much. If I hadn't talked to her, she wouldn't have said anything. Around 11.30 a.m., Mike called from Ross's office. They had completed analyzing the initial data dump, and he began to elucidate. She established a new email account, seemingly exclusively for his use. Conveniently, this aids our investigation, Initially unaware of his means of communication, we're now endeavoring to hack into his email. His correspondences are aggressively persuasive. He coerced her into discussing how you were her first and only, insinuating she needed to explore new experiences to invigorate the marriage. She shared lovemaking details of your life, which he absorbed and weaponized to his advantage. He hinted at spicing up your bed life and likely proposed a weekend rendezvous during their recent lunch. He's now asserting it's merely physical and insists if she truly loves you, it won't constitute infidelity, leveraging guilt to manipulate her. I discussed her behavior last night, noting she appeared consumed by these thoughts. She didn't even acknowledge my presence last night or this morning, I inquired. Are they still in contact or planning another lunch? Mike reviewed the messages and relayed the latest one. Just received. Let's meet for lunch at the beach club tomorrow and strategize. Liu loves you. And if you tell him, it won't be considered cheating, and he can't deny you a free pass. Her response was simply, okay. After wrapping up my discussion with Mike, I leaned back, contemplating my next move. Talking to her directly won't suffice. He'll persist, perhaps even resorting to taking her to a motel for a rendezvous. No, I need to stop this, or our marriage will end, I told myself. I called Ross and talked a bit before explaining the situation. It seems the man is trying to get with Ruby, and he's not being subtle about it. Even if I try to stop him, he'll find another way, like suggesting they go to a motel. I need a plan to stop this from getting worse. I'm thinking about getting a divorce. I also think I need a backup plan, but I'm not sure what it should be yet. What do you think? Ross took a moment before saying. Having a backup plan is smart, but if it doesn't work, he won't stop. I know his type, and he won't want to lose her. So if you can't forgive him... Divorce might be the only choice. I'll get some papers ready for your lawyer, or I can suggest one. I have my own, I said. He made a contract to protect my business in case of divorce. I called my lawyer and made an appointment for the next day at 9.30. When I got to his office in the morning, he looked at me carefully. Damn it. Who changed it? I chuckled. He knew me too well. Taking the cup of coffee his secretary provided, I began. Ruby is on the verge of betraying a salesman at her workplace has set his sights on her. She's taken the bait and now I see no other recourse. I'm devising a backup plan to halt everything. But if she cheats, Plana goes out the window. We spent the ensuing hour exploring potential courses of action. I favored a straightforward divorce. Our business, safeguarded by the agreement, would be divided evenly. And there were no children, thus eliminating the need for child support. The house would be sold. I had no intention of pursuing legal action against Clark, his employer, or her employer, too costly with slim chances of success. We sealed our agreement with a handshake. After settling the fee, I departed. He mentioned finalizing all documents and storing them in the archives for future reference. Ruby's demeanor fluctuated throughout the week. One evening she showed affection, while the next she barely acknowledged his presence. On Friday afternoon, Donna called me to tell me that Ruby got a big bunch of flowers and a postcard. 
This made me sure about what to do, so I asked for your opinion. While I was writing a message in the WhatsApp group, I saw Ross's message to Dan, inviting her to dinner at the Holiday Inn. We knew what he was up to, but the problem wasn't solved. I told Dan urgently to join me, hoping he'd succeed soon. I wished my own problem would be sorted out too. I was so worried that I kept dropping things. I told the group about the flowers and the message on the card. Mike replied quickly, saying, I'll check her email now. Nothing so far. Five minutes later, my phone rang, and without disconnecting, Mike directed me to check my WhatsApp. Opening the app, I found a document he had sent. It was a confirmation for a hotel reservation at a lakeside spot, approximately 30 miles from the city. The booking was for a double room for the upcoming Friday and Saturday, listing two names, Clark and Ruby. Returning to the call, I relayed the grim news. Yes, but the email is even worse. He proceeded to describe the contents as a cheater's guide, authored by Ruby, detailing what to say and do. He promised to forward it to me. As the email landed in my inbox, I read through a series of messages with the subject line weekend. It all began around two weeks ago when he sent her a link to the same hotel he eventually booked. In these exchanges, he expressed his desire to pamper her and suggested various forms of entertainment. Subsequent emails questioned her thoughts on the matter and lamented my supposed reluctance to fulfill her happiness. In the final message, he outlined the reservation details and provided a script of what to say and do to persuade me. It was essentially a manual for infidelity, advising her to cook a lavish dinner the following Thursday, engage in frequent closeness throughout the week, and assert that it would be purely physical with him, yet enriching. He appealed to her love for him, leaving the decision in her hands. It remained to be seen whether I would buy into it. I needed time to contemplate my next move. The weekend was busy and tiring. I couldn't talk about what I knew, but she was very kind. We had sex on Friday night, Saturday morning, and Saturday night, and it continued into Sunday. She wanted to have sex again on Sunday afternoon, and we had a quick encounter on Monday morning. Ross called at 3 o'clock on Monday with worrying news about the email. He said the situation was serious. According to Ross, she sent Clark a message, suggesting they meet on Thursday night. If Clark said no, she wouldn't go ahead, but if he said yes, she would. Ross also said that if Clark was worried, he should remember that it's often easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. I thanked Ross and asked him to gather all the important documents into a folder. He asked if there were any intimate photos, and I said yes. I heard him looking through papers and confirming there was a photo of them kissing, but not passionately. I told him to put everything in the folder with that photo on the front and send it all to my lawyer. He said he would do that. After that, I called my lawyer to tell him the folder was coming soon. We arranged to meet at the hotel on Saturday morning for breakfast. Divorce papers are really hard to deal with. On Monday night, she wanted to be close, but I said no because I had something important to do. I stayed in my office working until 2 a.m., and when I got to bed, she was already asleep. Even though it was late, I slept deeply and woke up at 6 to go to work. Just before she could try to be close again, a delivery person brought the folder we were expecting. I sat in my office and looked through it. There were some photos that had a sexy feeling. She has a way of being attractive that's hard to predict, but it definitely works. Ross talked about seven marriages he had helped end in the last year and a half, but he didn't give any names. There was also a note from Dan about something upsetting that happened at the Holiday Inn with his wife, Clark, and himself. Dan's wife ran away crying, and Ross had to take Dan home. They were trying counseling to save their marriage, especially because they have three young kids. This seemed to help them for now, especially since Dan's wife quit her job, so Clark was out of work. As I immersed myself in the folder's contents, my secretary entered, her gaze unwavering. Overcome with emotion, I divulged the entirety of the situation. Upon hearing my account, she inquired about my plans. For the first time, a smile graced my lips, recognizing her not merely as a secretary, but as a friend offering support. I also noticed an aspect of her I hadn't previously observed, her undeniable allure. In response to her supportive gesture, she returned my smile. I instructed, prepare for divorce. If she departs with him on Friday, she'll file at the hotel on Saturday. No second chances. I've been trying to devise a plan B to halt her, but my mind's too foggy for ideas. My secretary, who I formally addressed as Miss Atwood, but who preferred Kathy, grinned mischievously and quoted. She suggested, why not have your own weekend with your dream girl? I couldn't resist smiling back, asking, and who might that be? Though I already knew the answer, she replied, with me, of course. 
Your loyal secretary is urging you to clear your mind. It's strictly about physical release, unrelated to your marriage. Use this letter as a guide and send it to her before she does the same to you. The plan was simple, yet effective, compelling Ruby to face her betrayal. Tuesday night, I made love to my wife devoid of emotion, tough to do. Wednesday morning, neither of us desired a quick encounter. By Wednesday evening, tensions eased slightly, but only slightly. Thursday morning as I left the house, Ruby awoke, shouting about dinner, but I intentionally ignored her. Around noon, Ross called, informing me that Ruby messaged Clark, boasting about preparing a lavish dinner for me and promising to update him on our conversation. To surprise her, I went to the store and bought chicken, potatoes, and vegetables to bake, along with her favorite white wine. I got home by 2.30 and had everything ready and in the oven within two hours. Just as I was putting the potatoes in to bake, Ruby came back with shopping bags and looked confused. What are you doing? She asked. I smiled big. I'm just making dinner for you, my dear wife. I wanted to make it special before we talk. She looked surprised and said, Oh, I was going to cook dinner too. But after we eat, I have something important to discuss, so it's going to be a long night. Of course, I replied, turning away with a smile. I had already made a significant contribution to her plans. Dinner proceeded tensely. I kept the conversation flowing, deflecting any attempts to shift the focus onto me, urging her to savor the meal before sharing my own news. Once we finished, I took the lead. Bring your wine to the kitchen. We can talk there, I suggested. She followed. Earlier, I had discreetly placed a folder with a letter outlining her excuses on the kitchen table, concealed beneath a couple of magazines. Now I removed the magazines, revealing only the printed document. Ruby, you know I cherish you and would never intend injury, I began. But we wed young, and my lack of experience became apparent. Lately, my new secretary, Miss Atwood, or Kathy as she prefers, has been confiding in me. Her tales are captivating. I could listen for hours. Now, I need to clear her from my mind before we commit to spending our lives together. I've arranged a hotel stay with her for the weekend. It'll be purely physical, a chance for me to blow off steam and pick up some new techniques to try out with you later. It doesn't affect my love for you or our marriage. I'm telling you beforehand so it won't be seen as betrayal. I trust your love for me enough to allow me this one weekend outside of our marriage, knowing it won't impact us. Ruby's face flushed crimson, on the verge of exploding. She declared, over my dead body, and I want this woman gone by Monday morning or we're finished. Her reaction eased my tension and I erupted into laughter, remarking on her expression. It was priceless. Then, realization hit her. Every response she planned to give me, I had already anticipated. I closed the folder and handed it to her, revealing a photo of her kissing Clark on the cover. Her complexion turned ashen as she whispered, You knew when you played me. I smiled. Yes, I did. Your reaction is exactly what mine would have been if things were different. But I didn't book a hotel for us like you did. Unlike you, Miss Atwood and I never had lunches together, kissed, or talked about love or being close. My story was made up. But yours is true. As I talked, she looked through the folder and saw how much I knew. Dates, times, photos, emails, transcripts of calls. Everything was there. She was really angry. You followed me. You violated my privacy. How could you? I remain composed. That's all there is to it. Time to take action or not. I love you. But you need to understand there's a boundary, and you're teetering on it. You got yourself a boyfriend, engaged in an emotional affair, and planned to make it physical. You've humiliated me and jeopardized our marriage in the process. And yet, you're angry at me for trying to intervene. I thought we could work through this, but maybe I'm mistaken. I responded, more sorrowful than angry. What do you mean by humiliating you and wrecking our marriage? I never intended anything like that. It was separate from our marriage. Obviously, she retorted, citing from the infidelity playbook. Why should this affect us? Listen to what you're saying. I echoed her words and then pointed out, you responded to me as if I said the same thing over my dead body. So why is it acceptable for you to cheat, but not for me? She inhaled deeply as if preparing to speak. I raised my hand and interjected. There's no such thing as a free pass. If you go with Clark, it's cheating. Even if you inform me beforehand, it won't change the situation. She averted her gaze and murmured, I can't process this right now. I need to be alone. With those words, she rose abruptly and dashed upstairs, taking the folder with her. I heard the bedroom door shut and the lock engage. I tidied up the house and settled at the table. 
Ross had provided me with a tablet to access a server displaying all of Ruby's phone activity. I sat down and logged in. She was messaging with Clark. As I read her messages, I found her first one interesting. She was worried about someone watching them and having copies of their messages. When she got home, her partner had dinner ready and seemed to know what she was thinking, which made her angry. Later, he showed me a folder with all the details, including the reservation. Clark wasn't sure what to do. He didn't see it as a problem. He suggested telling the other person that everything was arranged and that they had to go through with it. He said they should talk about their love and question the other person's feelings. He seemed desperate. When I tried to follow his advice, my partner didn't agree. He said it would embarrass him and hurt our marriage. He insisted that even seeking his permission would be considered cheating. Feeling conflicted, I couldn't proceed. Despite the potential enjoyment of the weekend, I couldn't risk my future with Lou. Seeing his disappointment, I realized all his efforts and resources had been wasted, and he decided to take a significant risk. She was asked if she thought her husband would divorce her. She replied negatively, expressing doubt that he would find another woman like her. The suggestion was made for her to pack her bag and bring it to work to Gage's reaction. If that failed, they would proceed with the weekend plan, followed by seeking forgiveness on Sunday. Despite recognizing the nonsense, she fell for the suggestion. She concluded that if it seemed like her husband might leave her, she wouldn't proceed with the plan. She planned to see the person the next day. As she started thinking more rationally, he knew how to reassure her. I put away the tablet and started watching TV. Though my mind was preoccupied with everything, the decision was made to file for divorce on Saturday, though there was contemplation about postponing it. However, once initiated, there would be no turning back. The decision was made to proceed with the filing the next day. With the intention to demonstrate seriousness in a different manner, I phoned my lawyer and disclosed everything in detail. Hey, I dropped the bomb on her and Clark informed her that I'd forgive her. She's planning to pack her bag to see how I'll react. I don't want to start a divorce until they've slept together. Can we show her how serious this is? My lawyer had a good idea. He said we could give her a letter with a warning. We'll say that we know she's planning to cheat on Saturday. If she does, we'll start the divorce process on Saturday morning at the hotel. I thought we should make the letter longer and give it to her at her office, with Clark there if possible. What do you think? It'll show her that I'm serious. She said Clark would pick her up for lunch. I said we should give her the letter around 11 o'clock, even if he's there. Her employer would understand the situation. He's traditional and won't approve of her actions. But what would really upset him is if a process server showed up and caused a scene. About an hour later, the lawyer sent me a draft of the letter, perfectly suited to the circumstances. It detailed all the pertinent information and made it clear that she would be served. On Saturday morning, I sent a response confirming my approval of the plan. I checked the tablet. There were no further messages between Ruby and Clark, so I retired for the night. I tried to open the bedroom door, assuming it would be locked, but found it unlocked instead. When I went in, I saw Ruby in bed, like she was expecting something romantic. Her bag was packed in by the wall, which caught my eye. I noticed her choice and said it seemed like she picked Clark over our marriage. I didn't wait for her to answer. I just left and went to the guest room. She begged me to stay, but I didn't say anything. I lay on the bed with my clothes on and realized the letters were made up by someone else and didn't show the truth. But seeing her bag packed for a meeting with another man made me feel deeply hurt and betrayed. I felt really sad and cried all night. The next morning, I heard Ruby coming downstairs. I went back to our bedroom to shower and change, but my bag was gone. I wondered if she had taken it downstairs, unpacked it, and stowed it away. After showering, I caught a whiff of coffee and bacon, deducing the bag was downstairs. Entering the kitchen, I met her gaze, noting her nervous demeanor. My initial reaction was to encourage her, urging myself not to hold back. I suppose this lavish spread is an attempt to showcase the kind of wife you'll be if you choose to sleep with another man, but it won't sway me. If you go through with this, it's the end for us, I declared, deciding to lay it all out during our conversation. The lawyer and I agreed the divorce papers would be presented to you tomorrow morning at breakfast. Once delivered, there'll be no retracting them. There won't be forgiveness if you return home tonight. We'll commence counseling to rebuild trust and prevent a recurrence. Don't even consider returning. You're not welcome here. Turning to leave, she implored, please stay for breakfast. We need to discuss this. I faced her and replied, we've already had that discussion. Your packed bag suggests persuasion, not dialogue. I won't be having breakfast here, 
It's time you learn to fend for yourself if you choose to do so. I assume the bag's already in your car. She turned away, confirming my suspicions. Leaving the house without saying anything, at least she understood how serious her actions were. When I got to the office, Katie said, You look really bad. I smiled and said, And you look as beautiful as always. Before she could ask more, I said, I don't know how it went. When I showed her plan B, she got really angry. She wanted to fire you, and even said she'd only do it over her dead body. Then she took things into her own hands. This morning, I packed my bag for the weekend. At 11, she'll get a letter from me with instructions. Let's see if this makes her worried. As I spoke, Katie brewed coffee. Handing me a cup, she remarked, I hope she comes to her senses. Surely she can't be so foolish as to think this behavior is acceptable for her, but not for you. I offered a sad smile and settled at the table. The day was unproductive. Shortly after 11, my phone rang. It was Ruby. Through tears, her words were barely comprehensible. Are you serious? Are you really going to divorce me? Evidently, she had convinced herself I wouldn't follow through. Without hesitation, I replied, If you betray me, it's a breach of our agreement. We both know it. You divorce me if I cheated, right? Her answer was barely audible, but it was a firm yes. She coughed. Will you come home to talk? She pleaded. I'll be there in 20 minutes, I stated simply before ending the call. I arrived home first, brewing coffee. The smell of bacon she cooked earlier filled the kitchen, so I opened the window before I sat down to eat. She came to the house 10 minutes later. I was already pouring coffee when she came in. She had an envelope from the lawyer in one hand and her bag for the weekend on her shoulder. She left her bag at the door and stopped. I felt like she wanted to come to me, to hug me, but she wasn't sure if I would want that. I took the coffee to the table and asked her straight away. Are you still planning to go to the hotel? She said. How can you even ask that after sending this? Of course I'm not going. I love you. I want to be with you. I know you'd never allow it. So everything is cancelled. Now do we need to mend our marriage or will I still be served? She asked, taking her seat opposite me, chin lowered. Gazing at her, I reached across the table, lifting her chin to meet my eyes. You'll only be served if you show up at the hotel. No hotel, no papers. However, our marriage has been greatly strained. So here's what needs to happen, I explained. First, you'll call Clark in my presence. I want to hear you inform him that everything is off. Then you'll disable and delete your personal email for his sake. Afterward, you'll contact your boss, informing him of Clark's actions and requesting that he be barred from your office. Following this, we'll arrange for counseling. We must understand why you were drawn to this, why you thought I'd agree, and how we can rebuild trust, I concluded. Just as I finished, her phone rang. It was Clark. She put it on speaker, and I heard him inquire, Where are you, Ruby? I'm waiting for you at the reception and can't wait any longer. She took a deep breath, exhaling slowly. Alistair, I'm back home with Lou. Something he did shook me to my core. If I go with you, my marriage will be destroyed. I'm sorry, you're not worth it. That's why I'm not going, she explained. His rage was unparalleled. You're a foolish cow. Do you know how much effort, time, and money I've invested in you? And now you're leaving. When someone acts like a weakling and then turns into a bully, you're just strong. Screw you, he said angrily before hanging up. Ruby finally saw his true character a bad person. Turning off and deleting the email account was harder than we thought, but we managed it within an hour. When we finished, her boss and the HR manager came to our door. HR manager Mervyn Wood started by saying, We're very unhappy with what happened, but we're giving you a chance to keep your job. Now, please tell me what happened. Ruby wiped her eyes with a tissue before she spoke. As you know, about three months ago, our account was assigned to a new M metal sales agent, Alistair Clark. Previously, I managed this account and he used to come to me almost daily. Initially, I didn't notice, but he started flirting with me, complimenting my attire, hairstyle, and even my smile. Discussing my figure and appearance, I fell for it and started dressing more provocatively. He sent gifts like flowers and chocolates, then invited me to dinner. Foolishly, I accepted, and during the dinner he delved into personal questions about my life, my husband, and eventually, my bed life. He began belittling my husband claiming he was unworthy of me. It was a gradual process wearing me down bit by bit. Then he proposed a weekend getaway, but luckily Lou intervened. He gave me a letter saying he wanted a divorce, which made me realize what was happening. I told Alistair I wouldn't go and that Lou and I were trying to save our marriage. I plan to report what happened officially, so I'm glad you're here. 
Woods looked at the CEO, who nodded before speaking to Ruby. Well, Ruby, we're glad you told us the truth. Yes, it was a big mistake, and you're lucky to keep your job. We're not happy with the quality of a M. Metals products, so we're going to close their account. Consequently, Clark will be permanently removed from the office. Therefore, no further action will be taken against you. However, if anything similar happens again, you'll be dismissed. Is that clear? Ruby nodded meekly. Yes. They bid us farewell and departed. After their departure, we had lunch and then began searching for a consultant. Fortunately, locating one proved relatively simple. We placed a call and scheduled an appointment. The consultant agreed to meet with us the following day, which was Saturday. The time was set. Seated, we exchanged glances. After about 10 seconds, I approached Ruby, took her hand, and led her to bed. We made love. Later, we retired to bed and I drifted off to sleep with my head resting on her chest. I woke up around 5 a.m. and we shared a tender lovemaking moment, perhaps the first since she encountered Clark. The consultations proved fruitful. Ruby realized that Clark had used her fear of our life becoming boring and predictable. She also understood that she had accidentally given him the information he needed to control her. As for me, I realized that it was all just a game for him, and I started to appreciate how great our life was together. We didn't need anyone else to tell us how to live. The counseling took three months. Four years later, we're still really happy, and Ruby is pregnant with our first child. As for Mr. Clark, he had a bad fall at our local shopping center while going down the stairs to the parking lot. We don't know exactly what happened, but there were at least five husbands at the mall that day who didn't like him. We all wore black clothes and baseball caps and met at the place. We kept changing seats, so it was hard to know who was sitting at the table and who wasn't. Even though the police tried to split us up, none of us said anything. I'm sure one of us did it, I promise. Second story. GF of three years cheated with a kissing a stranger need advice from anyone at this point and lost. Both of us are 25. I found out this morning when she called me and told me what happened. Honestly, the story is long, but to sum it up, she's finishing school in Florida, with only one and a half months left until she moves back in with me. We've been living together for two years. We were in a long-distance relationship for only four months until she went out to a bar with her friends and kissed or made out with some random guy. I really think her story is not believable. She said she lost her purse, and this guy helped her find it after two hours, and then he kissed her. She told him she had a boyfriend, but she didn't mention pulling away or stopping it, just that it was a mistake while she was drunk. She told me about it two days later because she felt guilty. I don't know what to do since she's coming back in a month and a half. We've invested so much time in building what we have and we're planning to start a family. I already told her not talking to her till I figure things out. Either I'm moving out and moving on never look back or I try to forgive her and move on with our lives. I just don't know how I will ever be able to trust her again. This all happened completely out of the blue. I don't mistreat her. I constantly reassure her feelings, even flew out to visit halfway during her training. I asked for a reason so many times. All she gives me, this is the first time I've done this in my life and I regret every second, but there's not reasoning behind it besides she kissed some random dude at a bar while drunk. I told her since the start, I don't expect any type of cheating. I don't want to throw away what we built. Honestly, I ache what I'm doing anymore just in a weird place in my life. Yeah, I ache what else to say. Thanks for joining us on this chapter of Relation Tales. If you were moved by these stories, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Don't miss out on the upcoming emotional roller coaster of relationships. Your support means the world, and we can't wait to share more compelling tales with you. Until next time, remember, every relationship has a story worth telling. See you soon.